quarter one growth is really significant. And as a result, our recommendation has changed since then. Our initial recommendation was to buy the stock of Disney at a target price of $98 per share. However, Disney has shown outstanding performance in the quarter one of 2015. It has beaten the analyst expectation of EPS by 19% managed to get revenue of $30 billion for the quarter, and also managed to increase the ROE by 80% compared to the last year. So we actually updated our target price to $105 per share. However, the market actually uh, included this uh, premium, and uh, the, as of 18 February uh, 2015, the market price of Disney stock is about $103 per share. Therefore, uh, we are actually changing our recommendation from buy to hold. Although we believe that uh, this is uh, the target price uh, that Disney should be trading at, we also believe that Disney is a good company with great, great growth potential for the future. For example, the Disney movie entertainment business has uh, several good movies lined up for the next five years out of which 11 from Marvel and also 3 from the Star Wars franchise. In addition, uh, the Shanghai Resort is expected to open in 2016, which will give Disney more access to the Chinese market. The Disney consumer product business is actually booming right now. It has good product lineup, also good profit margin. And we also believe that it will do better in future using Disney's company-wide synergy. Projected on the screen is Disney's weekly closing prices over the last 10 years. The timeline starts at 2005 when Robert Iger had taken over as CEO. He is often commended for leading Disney's success over this time. And with this contract being extended through June 30th of 2018, we believe there is ample time for him to coach his successor and perhaps collaborate with him or her to spawn a greater ideas for Disney's future. And Disney's five business segments, while operating separately, have the ability to capitalize upon each other. For example, a successful movie by Studio Entertainment may be used as a basis for a ride or an attraction at Parks and Resorts, and consumer pro products may also take on the merchandise licensing on the same hill. And obviously the recent great example of this success is Frozen. So Disney has competitors as a conglomerate, such as 21st Century Fox and Time Warner, and these companies also operate within Disney's five segments, in addition to other companies such as Activision Blizzard that Disney may be competing within the segments. However, taking Disney's past performance, current performance, and their growth potential, we believe that Disney has a great competitive positioning. Within 2014, media networks, while experiencing some setbacks with the rise in sporting costs, uh, ESPN just still showed great numbers. Parks and Resorts, they have continuously uh, rated top on the worldwide attendance. And finally, Interactive showed profit for the first time with their change in business strategy. Uh, Disney has record setting performance for the last four years in a row. In 2014, Disney managed to get $49 billion revenue. The most important part is that Disney didn't sacrifice its net profit margin. Disney was able to do that over the years, uh, mainly because of the fact that Disney has higher pricing power over its competitors. In addition, historically Disney has paid dividends, uh, but it's much lower uh, compared to the market. Uh, but recently Disney has focused more on giving the fund back to the shareholders in the form of higher dividends. The most recent dividend of $1.15 is actually 34% higher than the previous year. Uh, Disney also has managed to achieve better ROE and uh, return on asset over the years, except for 2013. Uh, in 2013, Disney actually increased the return earnings to support the share buyback. Recently, the board of Disney has approved $400 million share buyback program without any specific completion date. Okay, so for the evaluation of the Walt Disney Company, we use two discounted cash flow models and one of our relatives or multiples valuation approach. Our target price of $105 with 60 cents is the weighted average of, each, of the results of each of our three models. 
our target price range is given by our lowest estimation of $83 to our highest valuation of $124. So looking into uh, Disney's current market value, we conclude that the, the stock is fairly priced right now. However, taking into account Disney's ongoing projects, we cannot disregard the possibility that <laughs> Sorry, the animation yeah. stopped coming up. All right. We cannot disregard the possibility that the stock price might reach the high end of our range for an upside of about 20%. Next slide, please. We expect higher than average growth rate in, in, in business earnings for the next three years, which is going to be translated into higher cash inputs for the company to use to repurchase shares as dividend payments and to invest its capital expenditures to the Shanghai Resort, which is set to open in summer 2016. Disney's beta was estimated using a multi-factor econometric model that uh, simultaneously fits the mean and the variance of the, of the time series of Disney's result, the returns, sorry. Um, we chose the CAPM as the model for the mean and a general uh, autoregressive heterostatisticity model, or GARP for short, uh, for the variance. The result of 1.09 was then used to estimate a cost of equity capital of 8.38%. This cost of equity, along with the market value of equity and the market value of debt, yield the weighted average cost of capital of 7.7%. Management seems to have a target capital structure, therefore it has remained really constant throughout the past five years. We do not expect this to change. Therefore, the best valuation model for the Walt Disney Company is free cash flow to equity. So we weighted that model with 40% of our target price. Our second DCF model, free cash flow to the firm, was weighted with 25% because it still accounts for the complexity and richness of our performance statements. And the, and the remaining 35% was, uh, was granted to our multiples valuation uh, model. We chose to use uh, EV over EBITDA because this multiple accounts or takes into account depreciation and amortization, which uh, means that it is better suited for companies with high invest investments in fixed assets, just like the Walt Disney Company, resorts, parks, studios, etc. If you look into the multiples comparison graph, EV to EBITDA seems to corroborate our conclusion that the uh, company is fairly priced by the market right now. However, the PE ratio seems to tell a different story, especially since the release of Q1 results for fiscal 2015. And that story is that the time to enter the market right now is not optimal. So uh, in terms of uh, market cap, Disney is the biggest among its competitors, as you can tell in the bubble graph in the corner. First off, I apologize for the recent outburst. Um, before I start the as we evaluated the company, we took some factors into consideration that may pose as a risk in the future. Disney has uh, experienced economic risks, such as fluctuations in seasonality. Uh, during the summer, parks and resorts, uh, they enjoy higher attendance. In the winter, consumer products does better because of holidays rolling around. The recent concerns in IT, um, most notably Sony's intellectual property reach, Disney does take precautionary measures to safeguard their property. However, obviously nothing is 100% it is also important for Disney to renew their contracts and programming on terms that are beneficial to them. Uh, if that were not the case, it is possible that unexpected costs would be imposed upon Disney. And finally, it is very important to keep into regulatory facts and legal facts. Disney is a multinational company, and it is important to keep in mind the discrepancies that may be across the borders. Uh, because Disney has a synergetic business model, uh, if one segment is affected, it is possible that others will become affected as well. However, in the near future, we do not think these factors will pose a risk to where it cannot be contained by the company. Okay, so in conclusion, because of the aforementioned factors and Disney's ongoing projects that are sure to tap into the unparalleled synergies between business segments, as well as Bob Iger's continuous leadership, we would like to reinstate our whole recommendation for the Walt Disney Company. Even though it is currently priced fairly in the market, we believe that the Walt Disney Company has great potential for growth. Therefore, if you have it in your portfolio, hold on to me. Thanks. We'd like to have to open the floor for questions. If margins uh, there showed a consistent ascent uh, for about 10 plus go back to about 15 percent. In the financial analysis. Thank you.
they'll continue to ascend, or what do you think would be the normal normal level that margins would be yeah, the end of the next few years? We are actually considering the profit net profit margin to remain at a level of about 15.37 or 15.5 percent. The reason being that um, well, Marvel is releasing about 11 Marvel movies that the consumer's uh, product business segment is going to feed off of. Um, so that's going to increase everything at once without actually having to invest a lot of money in marketing and that kind of uh, stuff. So we do not expect costs to increase at the same uh, speed or rate as revenues. Therefore, increasing profit margin or remaining constant at least. And can you, can you kind of go into any detail about what's driving both, so we've got these five segments. What's driving the growth in the, in the profit margin? What segments are contributing the most? Yeah. Do you think that'll continue? And and, and, and just not in growth, but, but where's the 15.37? Is the parks much higher than the content? I don't know. I mean, I just like to get some detail on what's driving that, given they've got some, such great Segments. The media network segment is actually uh, responsible for. Uh, I'm sorry, starting out here. The media network segment is actually responsible for around 45 to 50 percent of the Disney's revenue. So. Uh, That's revenue. Revenue, yeah. yeah. Additionally, that very same sector accounts for 42 percent of operating income, which also takes into account costs. Uh, Disney al uh, already has invested uh, through ESPN, like uh, in the NFL matches and uh, college football matches. So we are not expecting like the expenses to increase in future. So we are actually expecting the revenue margin, the profit margin will remain almost in the 15 and a half seat. And yeah. we took into consideration that first quarter, uh, because of NFL prices, it, it was a little tougher at Disney. However, they made investments into a uh, Maker's, Maker's Studio for YouTube, and then streaming is becoming a huge thing. And Sling TV, which was in partnership with Dish Network, um, they're, offering, they're offering a consolidated package, and almost half of their networks provided are ABC, Disney, something related to Disney, ESPN, ABC, and Disney. So they're targeting the market that currently does not utilize cable. It's more geared towards uh, college students or more cost-conscious audience. So we believe that they're going to be able to tap that market by doing so. Yeah. And just one last point for that question. Uh, the interactive business, although it's the smallest one, is not losing money anymore. So they're actually bringing uh, profit into the table, which contributes to the net profit margin. And what's interactive business related to that? Uh, games. Okay. Games, uh, mobile games, and their biggest product is Disney Interactive, which is a uh, Wii, Xbox, and PlayStation game. Uh, the uh, latest hit was the Infinity series. Yeah, Disney Infinity, yes. Yeah, they're focusing more now on mobile games in addition to like educational mobile games because they want to tap into that market's still growing. So we believe that it's going to serve as a positive for the interactive segment and momentum is going to continue. So in other words, this growth of 10 to 15, which is a huge growth in profit margin, right, over four years, you're not expecting that to continue. That's not factoring into your, your, your price target, right? You're no, expecting that we're expecting that that 50% is going to remain relatively constant. Okay. So what, what are the assumptions in your DCF if there is a pretty substantial growth in the free cash flow? Yeah. Um, So our DCF model, um, well, obviously, it takes a lot of um, into consideration. Um, out of which, some of the main assumption is that dividend per share is not going to increase as much over the future. So that's going to hold a little of the cash back into the company to invest in capex. And the reason why we're not increasing this as much is because they just augmented it by thirty-four percent. I mean, it'd be only. Uh, uh, conservative to remain at this constant for the next year. Uh, one of our other assumptions is that the repurchase of common stock program is going to remain sort of at the same level, but also going to be affected because of the increased capex in the Shanghai Resort, which is the most ambitious project so far. Um, so because of that, we're actually losing a little and then bringing it back up to the 400 million shares repurchase program that was just authorized by the board in the last uh, press release. Um, and again, CapEx is going to increase as management stated for about 
uh, 1.5 million dollars more than in 2014. That's what's expected to happen. So we consider that into our model. Is that Shanghai or is that? That's Shanghai. Primarily that's Shanghai. that's primarily Shanghai. And after Shanghai is completed in 2016, then capex should go back to a relatively uh, stable, uh, stable range. What about top line growth? Yes. So for our DCF valuation, we're using, as we, as we say, a WAC of 7.7% and cost of equity capital of 8.38%. Um, we are using, oh, it's not here, but uh, long-term growth rate is 3.52% for equity, which is given is a long-term growth rate of uh, uh, GDP for the United States given by the OECD, and 3.52% uh, for uh, cash flow to the firm. How much pricing power do you think Disney has uh, with the cable providers, the direct TVs, and people like that? You, you mentioned rights fees as being a, uh, a risk, but the other side of that is what you're able to generate by paying those right, rights fees. Um, how much pricing power do they have there and with their advertising? Well, in terms of sporting events, obviously it has a huge following within the United States. Um, the ESPN consistently brings number one in between men. So we believe that Disney does have pricing power in that market. Um, like I said before, the NFL sporting content is going up, but when you look at the ads that have been uh, aired through those high-profile games per se, they you know they hit millions, um, multiple millions. And with I believe it was top 20 um, in in history, the most viewership. ESPN in terms of sporting, ESPN was all top 20. None of the other sporting networks were up there. Right. In fact, uh, the top five most viewed events in cable history yes. for are ESPN. Football games, right? Probably football, football games or football the game. Olympics or some other sports. And also, uh, there is the recent movement on cutting the cord. So Disney, uh, and she already talked about the slim TV. So if Disney goes in that route, uh, Disney will have uh, higher pricing power over the uh, competitors. And also, uh, there is a recent research that showed that uh, over 70 percent or 80, uh, 70 to 80 percent media consumption is now happening on the handheld devices. So uh, I believe that Disney will move towards that uh, segment and will also increase the revenue in future. Yeah, just going back to your question, here the long-term growth uh, rate that we used. You had a good competitive analysis in one of your slides. Um, could you expand on that a little bit, particularly where you see uh, Disney's uh, valuation? It's a, it's a much higher valuation being justified. How do you see it competing in the changing landscape? There's a lot of reorganizations of media companies now. Um, right. Particularly with the podcast Yeah, so out of all of these competitors, this is DreamWorks, by the way, and Madison Square Garden. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the name was just too long. But anyway, <laughs> out of all these competitors, only Comcast can enjoy some sort of synergy between business segments the way Disney can with uh, Universal Parks, and at the same time that the movie is going on, which is just marketing by itself. Um, so because of that, we believe that, and obviously it's market um, cap of the Walt Disney Company, we believe that the price is being supported. This this high multiples. If you get rid of these two, um, EV to EBITDA, which takes into account the heavy investments on fixed assets, um, is about middle table. So that supports a uh, conclusion for a, a fair valuation of the Walt Company. For the PE ratio, um, again, getting rid of these two is the highest among its peers. And the reason is because the recent earnings release. I mean, the, the facts have shown great success. You're expected to continue their momentum. They have a lot of movies coming out. Every business is going to feed off of each other. And, well, I personally think that the Star Wars movie is going to compete with Avatar, the top crossing mm -hmm. movie of all time. But also the market cap supports these high multiples. Do you see any um, merger of any of those two other firms to be a real threat to Disney? Um, I don't think so. I, I mean, I'm just speculating here. Uh, but I don't think they're going to move. Yeah. Well, if you could have picked your firm yeah. right, it doesn't make sense. Why would it ever happen? You said killer? Oh, that's it. Sorry. No, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah.